Good Monday morning here on the Cross Border Injury Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, as always, the host of the show. And this week is kind of special. This week, we are talking one of the biggest injuries, if not the biggest industry here in the province of Alberta, but also the uh, country that is Canada. We are talking oil and gas, and we are going to take a little bit of a different tack here. We're going to be talking oil and gas with the people who have poured their blood, sweat, and tears into the oil and gas sector for their life and has helped them become who they are. And over this next five days, we're going to be talking to a range of different people who have make who make up the oil and gas sector. And today we have a returning guest to the show, a returning guest to the show who has graciously accepted the role of being our first sort of oil and gas sector worker. And that is Naomi Withers. Naomi, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor. And yet again, another pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Chris. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Naomi, I, I'm going to start off this week's line of questions a little bit differently than the last time you were on the show. So I have to ask you the question of what does the oil and gas industry mean to you? To me, the oil and gas industry is about opportunity. Um, I think if you take it and you view it as the energy industry instead of the oil and gas industry, we've got a lot of space to grow. Um, a lot of space to add vibrancy to our city here as Calgary and the province, um, an opportunity to really innovate and use technology to make sure that we have you know, energy for the future. And that's what I think the oil and gas in- industry really is, is a future still for Alberta. Now, prior to our interview, we had talked about your start in the industry. We didn't get into too much details, but you have been in the energy industry since 2010. What brought you to the energy industry? So I I actually started my career with GE Energy um, and an electrical uh, distribution business here when it was in Calgary. And they actually shut down and moved out to Ontario for, um, you know, better opportunities for that company. And so I went on LinkedIn and we had a booming oil and gas industry. And I was snagged by Shell Canada um, within almost what felt like minutes of of putting a post up there saying that I was looking for, for a role. And so to me, it was presented such huge opportunities to not only grow my career, but really learn um, as a newcomer to the energy industry. So we had great companies out there that supported their new professionals and Shell was one of them. And so I was happy to move from the energy uh, industry and in being you know electrical energy to oil and gas ener- energy. Now, what was your first job in the, at Shell? So in that uh, 2010, I'm assuming is when you started with Shell. I was in in continuous improvement. Um, So I adopted lean and Six Sigma methodologies in our oil sands operations to make sure that we were eliminating wastes from our processes to make sure that every dollar was spent on something that created a return on investment for the company. Okay, so you just said a few things there that uh, I'm going to go, huh? And a lot of my listeners are going to go, Sig Sigma? What did she just say there? So um, talk to me about what your first job in the industry, as if I was your child. Talk to to me like I'm a seven-year-old child learning about the oil and gas industry for the very first time, because I think there's a lot of miscommunication, a lot of misunderstanding that the oil and gas sector in the province of Alberta is the people who are out laying the pipe. And that's it. There's nothing else that happens. So I want to know from you, and I'm going to ask this to all my guests are on this week. What is your, what was your job when you first got in? Were you out there laying the pipe or were you doing something else? Well, I was out riding in a 797 haul truck um, with a computer on my lap, uh, pressing, you know, F14 or, you know, (laughs) F12. um, Every time the truck lifted its bucket and every time the truck lowered its bucket, dropping the actual oil sands material into what's called the hopper, so the giant um, processing pit, um, to see how fast the trucks did that activity, because we were looking at buying new trucks, and we wanted to make sure that that process of unloading the oil um, was as efficient as possible. So it was my job, boots on the ground, sitting in a haul truck next to a driver for you know a 12-hour day, and timing the efficiency of our different models of trucks so that when we went to make a purchase decision and buy new trucks 
we made sure that they were as fast as possible in doing that activity. That's, it seems like a very one-off job. Like it seems like that would be a one-time thing. And But yeah. would you be doing this for other, uh, like not just trucks, but also pipes no, or exactly. what else? Every process to making, making sure that they were as efficient as possible. Um, mapping where we put our washroom cars in our oil sands mine to make sure when drivers needed a break, we were you know, positioning those in the most efficient ways possible because you make money by moving oil, um, by moving the actual bitumen. And so you know, designing the, helping design the mine to make sure that we had lunch rooms in the right spots and planning the break schedules to make sure that we were moving bitumen at all times. So it was about finding processes that we've never looked at and making them as efficient as possible to make sure that we were actually producing oil in the best way. Now, 2010, like you said prior, when you put out your resume after uh, GE left, um, was the height of the boom in Alberta for, well, one of the booms, I should say, height of one of the booms in Alberta. Um, the oil and gas industry has gone through a lot of ups and downs over the years, and you have been sort of at the front row of seeing that. Um, take me through working in the oil and gas industry while there were was it while it was on such a roller coaster over the last 11 years yeah i mean i've had the opportunity um to have a great career um and to stay in oil and gas but many haven't um, the biggest thing is the uncertainty um, of, are you employed next year or next month um, because companies need to find ways to make sure that they're balancing their books um, when oil price drops, it has a huge effect on not only the morale of the workers, but the actual available jobs. And so to go through reorganizations in a company um, and apply for your job um, is one of the, the big stresses of working in oil and gas. So you know the value you add. Um, my current role, I'm in supply chain, so I negotiate contracts, making sure that you know we're saving money where we can and buying the right products. So I add value in my role. Um, but it doesn't matter if the capital assets don't match the operational costs. And you just used a word there that I want to pick up on because this is this is the big thing that this this week is mostly about is morale. That the last eleven years there has been, like you said, a big uh, morale change, uh, ups and downs, and right now we are seeing somewhat of a climb of oil prices. So I'm assuming uh, morale is going up a little bit because when gas prices, when uh, oil prices are up, people are happy because that means we're making more money. Um, during the low parts, though, it feels like sometimes you can be get you can get kicked when you're down. Um, have you experienced the low parts yourself or have you been uh, fortunate enough to be able to say, while I'm still potentially laid off next year, laid off next month, I still have had the opportunity to have these, this job for my last 11 years through the highs and the lows of the oil collapse and boom. Yeah. So um, I, I worked for Shell Canada and um, for their Albion oil sands asset. And that business was actually sold to Canadian Natural. And so I was transitioned from Shell to Canadian Natural. And that was one of those, those situations that you could have taken as a, oh no, or you, you leverage it um, to get new experiences, see a different company. And so it was really about taking it as it comes and managing those highs and lows and, and seeing the opportunities in it. Um, I know many of my colleagues um, you know, have left the oil and gas industry and to be lucky enough to continue on even through a transition from one major company to another, um, you have to count that you're that you're lucky to have those new opportunities and experiences. In the last 11 years, you have seen a transition from the traditional way of oil and gas exploration, the traditional way of uh, governments interacting with the oil and gas sector to what we have now. And I want to talk about that for a long time because you are the people, like I said at the, in, in the introduction, who have poured your blood, sweat, and tears. And I know that is a metaphorical statement, but this is your livelihood. This is the livelihood that you have made for you and your family. Um, 
there have been good times and good governments for the oil and gas sector. And we have right now a federal government who just recently announced that we're going to cap emissions on the oil and gas sector in Canada. I want to want to know from you, and you. I'm not. I'm not sure if you can speak as a, as generically as possible on this, but let's just talk about you f- to start with. How have you felt seeing governments use the oil and gas industry as a wedge issue when it comes to Canadian politics or Alberta politics? So, as a, I guess, almost politician. <laughs> having run for city council to me it's not right it's 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 you know deciding who to vote for for city councilor because of their stance on masking Um, it's deciding who to vote for for prime minister because of their stance on oil and gas it is a necessary industry if alberta stops producing oil and gas it just means that canadians will import and where we're getting that oil and gas from will have less stringent economic um, standards than Canada does. We will actually produce more greenhouse gas emissions because of the importation and transportation process to get that product to the Canadian shores. And so to me, it's about looking at the really big picture of the costs to the Canadian economy of producing oil and gas locally and of importing it. And right now we don't have enough low cost new energy alternatives to transition from oil and gas. And so I think, and what I'd like to see is the government work towards those new technologies, making sure we can build net zero homes, making electric vehicles more efficient and more affordable. And then it doesn't need to be the wedge. We have so many other levers that we can pull to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to get us to net zero by 2050, why are we targeting this one piece that will actually have a detrimental impact on not only the job market in Alberta, but our GDP as a country if we don't have people with an income spending money in our province? Um, you, uh, the, the, the industry over the last, uh, I would say, five years has been in trying trying to recover because the oil and gas collapse uh pipes pipelines to other markets are not being built and your job will, uh, currently at CNRL is the supply chain professional so you're the one who are is higher is is getting the goods to ensure that we continue to have bitumen pulled out of the ground so that way we can sell it to other markets um you you are seeing, you, you literally would see the, the highs and the lows of when production is down, you don't need supply. When production is up, which I'm assuming is now, you get more supplies. When you see governments using the oil and gas industry as, we need to expand operations, oh, we need to decrease operations, um, has the market just Figured figured that out itself and government needs to get out of the oil and gas industry's way to just let the market do what the market does. Because if the government just walked away tomorrow and said, just figure it out yourself, we would still have the highs and the lows, wouldn't we? We would still have the highs of people wanting more oil and people wanting less oil for sometimes. Like, just explain to me the supply part when it comes to government, because I hear governments time and time again explaining that we need to ramp up oil production, but if no one's buying it, there's no point to ramping up oil production, is there? I think there's always a use. Um, people you know, think of oil and gas as the you know, actual gasoline in their vehicles, yeah. <laughs> um, but it produces the asphalt that paves your roads. Um, it's jet fuel um, for international air travel. It is Um, chemicals that are derivatives of oil and gas products that we use. And so it's not just about producing engine oil and producing unleaded gasoline. Um, There are so many more byproducts of the oil and gas industry, like plastic, um, that we need to think about in terms of what we produce. 
Um, and so that's one thing is it's not just about producing gas to put in cars. And I want to make that kind of more clear to people that reductions on emissions for the oil and gas industry hit way more sectors than people are really aware of. Um, so it's not just about not having your diesel truck. It's about not ever getting on a plane ever again. Do you think the government knows that? <laughs> and I, when I say that, I, I I get the Alberta government gets that, whether it be the NDP or the Conservatives. I, I would hope that they would understand that. But we have a federal government who... No, they have, a, they have a hand to play. Um, they truly need to guide policy to make sure that we are pushing the boundaries of responsible production. Okay. That we are meeting and pushing environmental standards and regulations so that we are a leader um, when it comes to our responsible you know, stewardship of the lands. And I think that's really critical. Have um, you seen uh, the oil and gas industry and the energy industry as a whole change because of the times that we are in when it comes to environmental stewardship and then comes to uh, better better exploration uh, of our resources in the last 11 years that you've been with it? Or how, was it already changed before you got there? So I don't know if it's about better exploration, but it's better exploitation. That's the so, word. Thank you. I apologize. That was the word I was looking for. It's about, you know, um, if there's a, an oil and gas reservoir underground, you can produce so much of it. Um, but there's new technologies that actually allow us to pull more of that product from underground and put it into our pipeline systems. Um, and government grants and working relationships with universities help us to increase that technology so that we have to dig less. We have to put less, um, you know, wells because we can actually produce more. And so that's where, you know, I think that we've got some benefits and that we're using that new technology to make sure that we are exploiting those resources and actually causing less environmental impact because we can get more out of the ground on a single well. Um, you know, there's introductions of something called horizontal drilling. So you can, um, it looks like there's one well site on the ground, but it actually branches underneath like a root system. And so the impact to the surface is far less because we have the ability to reach. Um, but we also have huge advances in things like carbon sequestration, um, which we've seen in the last 10 years, which is about converting um, how we would have looked at emissions um, and greenhouse gases and actually um, preventing them from escaping to the atmosphere and causing more impacts to our climate. So we've got huge advances that these companies are doing not only as a result of government intervention, but on their own, because they know that they have a license to operate that is upheld by citizens. And so we have to make sure that we're being responsible as companies in doing that. Do you think, and I, you might not be able to answer this, and I do not want to put you in an awkward position of answering this. Do you think the oil and the energy industry companies are doing a good enough job explaining what you just explained that we are doing it environmentally responsible that we are looking at the benefits and we're looking at new uh, technology to ensure that we are not hurting more parts of the like not not uh, doing more than we need to do and we can get to the resources in a less impactful way than we once did where we had to would have to just put a hole in the ground and hope that we hit the oil because this goes back to the morale question. I, I have had people on this show who come on the show and say that we need to stop production tomorrow of the oil and gas sector because it is hurting our environment. But you just said that you are doing it in a responsible manner. Do you think the companies need to do more communications around how you are actually explore, uh, exploding the uh, resources that we have in this province? Or no matter what communications you do, we will always have people who think that you are destroying the environment, even though you're not. So there are impacts to the environment. And I want to be, you know, understand that there are, but it's, it's, about not, not sure as that, much as they no, say not as much as they say and it's about are people willing to have an ear to that conversation yeah and so I don't think we can share the message as much as we want to um but it's about making sure that we're actually 
have a forum to have open conversations and dialogue. And I think that having two-way conversations is the way that we fix the miscommunication and the misinformation around the impacts of the energy industry is trying to make sure that, you know, we've got a seat at the table. So there's, um, you know, when there's international conferences, um, does Alberta show up? Um, do we have representation from our federal government? Um, you know, we, where we do have a liberal seat here in Calgary, so we have a connection to the leading party. Um, so how do we leverage that to have an Alberta conversation at a federal level? And then how do we, you know, create spaces to have a two-way conversation about what the energy industry adds? And then realize that there are some negative social and environmental impacts of what we do, but understand how we're working to limit those and negate them. You have been in the industry for 11 years, and you just used a word that I want to get your, your reaction on. You said misinformation. In your 11 years, what has been the biggest misinformation you have heard about your industry that you work in, that you supply uh, your livelihood for your family in? So, I mean, for me, it's about how um, oil sands exist and they occur naturally. Um, so when we talk about there being oil in some of our rivers up in Northern Alberta, um, it naturally exists in the landscape. And so- um, I feel you know, like the tweets are coming in as we are saying this and- if you do yeah. want to send negative comments, please send it to our email. We'll file it away in the appropriate location as we have done every other negative comment. We are having an open conversation to the people who are listening. Yeah. Uh, if you want to come on and rebute or say something di completely disagreeable, send us a message. We might have you on. But right now we're talking about the oil and gas industry with Naomi. Continue <laughs> on, Naomi. <laughs> so it occurs naturally. Yeah. Um, and, and it's our job to make sure that we producing it don't cause harm, but it is a naturally occurring substance. And that it doesn't come from dinosaurs. What? <laughs> yes, it does, doesn't it? Doesn't no, it? No, it is it? not fossilized yeah. dinosaurs. Journalism is in crisis, and our mission here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast is to tell the story that isn't being told. It is vital that independent journalism survives with the rise of fake news. Every penny that is contributed to the Cross Border Interview Podcast goes to help continue our work to tell people's stories. All of our content is produced and edited by our team. The Cross Border Interview Podcast provides entirely free content, and we will never hide stories behind paywalls. By supporting a new model of journalism, our listeners, like you, are supporting real, independent journalism. Consider making a monthly donation via our Patreon account, or make a one-time donation by Interact eTransfer. Now, let's get back to the show. You have just blow, like, this, this is how green I am about the oil and gas sector industry here, people. That's literally, where does it, like, is it just like, okay, now you're going <laughs> to, Jesus, Mother well, Joseph, I am so confused now. I, I feel like Chris, magic. Please don't tell me you thought it came from dinosaurs. But I know people who do. And that's the scary part because they, 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 and this is the part where it gets me because you just said something that I know people are going to pick up on. Like, yes, it does. Because I read it on the internet. I'm going to burst a big bubble for everyone who's watching this right now or listening to this. The internet can be wrong. <laughs> Wikipedia can be wrong. It's a weird concept, but don't take your sources from uh, Wikipedia. Um what other mis in what other misinformation or miscommunications or mis ideology is there out there that you in the industry have heard and said 
how can people think this? How can people believe this is what the oil and gas industry and the energy industry in Canada has done? Because I have worked it for 11 years and it's completely wrong. I mean, I, I don't know that the, the, mis, you know, the, the misnomers, the misinformation is specifically about the oil and gas industry, but it's about you know, the impacts of mining um, and, and, and really visually seeing what the impacts of mining are. We see tailings ponds, um, which is, you know, a byproduct of producing um, bitumen in our oil sands operations. But tailings ponds exist in all kinds of mining operations. Um, and it's about recovering those um, and putting the landscape back to better than it was when you got there. Um, and I don't think people know that part, that you actually have to put it back better. Um, so you can't just reclaim it. It needs to be to a higher standard. Um, and that process costs the energy companies millions of dollars. And they want to participate in that. They are good stewards of the land. And so they are trying to reclaim it to that higher standard. And they don't know that that message is, is shared. And I don't think it is as well, because I think there's a lot of people who just assume that there's a lot of abandoned um, uh, mules out there or oil wells out there that aren't being cleaned up. But while there are a few bad actors, and yes, there's always going to be a few bad actors. I, I don't think anyone can disagree with that. There are companies like Shell, like CNRL, who do the work, who put the money in to ensure that the land is put back almost better than what they found it in. Yeah, so... So that's there's an abandoned um, orphan well program that the government's run and all oil and gas companies um, were in that area actually contribute into it so that when a company goes out of business or goes under um, because there are smaller companies out there doing work, um, there is a pool of money that helps to reclaim that um, when the initial company who might have done the drilling is no longer in existence. And so the governments across BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, um, have been doing huge work recently to make sure that all of those abandoned and orphaned wells are actually reclaimed to a really high standard right now. Um, we are, this is going to be, this is airing in the first week of December. So we are months away from 2022. I want to turn now to the future and your job in the future, because as we have talked about, the oil and gas industry is on a rebound. Uh, higher prices, it seems like people are, uh, exploring more money is getting put into the industry but also um there seems to be a need for canadian bitumen and as much as people don't uh, might not agree with that as much as some people might not agree with that statement i still think it's the best uh bitumen in the world we are oh i i feel like there's a little child with you right now <laughs> okay okay sorry um I, I want to know from you, what does your job look like in 2022 and the future? Is it still doing the same thing or are you always evolving your position? Yeah. So what I do for work now is I negotiate contracts. So I look at what we need to buy, um, the goods that we need to produce, the services, the people, the manpower or the, the people power rather. Um, and I make sure that we have that. So regardless of what we're producing or how much we're producing, my job stays relatively the same as finding innovative companies that can help us produce oil and gas in the most cost-effective and efficient manner possible. Um, you, you are seeing sort of the increase of the sort of the, the next, hopefully knock on wood, boom. Um, do you have hope for the oil and gas industry and the energy industry in Alberta in 2022 that we might start seeing the the years of 2010 again where people can apply and a few minutes later they will get that job? I don't think it'll go back to you don't. 2010. No, um, we've seen an exodus of companies um, from the market. And so the ones that have stayed um, we'll see the benefits and we'll see growth, but we've seen lots of companies leave. And so for me, it's there's still a limited job market in the energy industry. 
Um, and the new companies that are coming are not necessarily going to be energy companies. Um, and so that's the, there's going to be a shift. Um, my last question here for you, uh, because I don't want to take uh, too much of your time because I know you're a busy uh, uh, worker, but also mother. And I just don't want to make, I want to make sure that you uh, get back to your regular scheduled day. Um, talk to the people who are listening right now. Talk to the, 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 the people who might not know fully about the oil and gas industry. You are that you you and many other people in the province of Alberta are neighbors, our friends, our colleagues, yeah. our people who uh, who play soccer. You're the soccer mom who goes with their children to play soccer with someone else's child. Yeah. Uh, I I want to I want to word this question correctly here, and I apologize if I I'm gonna I might cut this part out if I word it incorrectly here. First off. You, you, the, the stereotype of the oil and gas industry are the blue collar workers who uh, are roughnecks, who uh, work at, like I said, work in the oil and gas industry, lay pipe, uh, they drink at night, so on and so forth, because that's what the stereotype is. But you're not. You, you are your neighbors, your friends, your city council candidates who want to make this city, this province, this country a better place. Talk to the people who are listening and tell them why the oil and gas industry still matters. And while we are still transitioning, it will still matter for the future. For me, the oil and gas industry is a supply chain. So it employs the person who actually creates the pipe, um, that steel worker, which is my dad growing up. He worked at a steel mill and he made the pipe. It is the geophysicist who went to university um, to study physics and mathematics to make sure that we understand the data behind producing oil and gas. It's the supply chain expert who um, employees, you know, who writes the contracts for companies who employ the service workers. It's the HR professionals who manage, you know, the, the professional base. Um, it is the workers on site who drive the trucks, who manage the, the derricks. Um, and then it's the other end. It's the refining and the upgrading side where we have chemists and scientists and engineers. And so the oil and gas industry, well, yes, we produce black gold. It is so much more than just that actual on-site production. It's really, you know, a science. Um, and it's a science that adds value to our economy um, and allows you to do the things that you want to do. It allows you to drive your car to work or drive your kids to school or, you know, take the school bus. Um, it allows you get, to get on the plane and to drive on beautifully paved roads. Uh, that are made of asphalt, which is the oil and gas byproduct. And so to me, yes, I worked up in Fort Mac and we had the Albion Village Bar and, you know, you had, you know, those pieces of it. But after a 12 hour shift on a mine site, you know, there's opportunities to relax, just like in every other, you know, setting, work setting where you go for a beer after work. Um, but by no means does that shape the whole industry. It's about hard workers who are well-educated, who are doing their best to make sure they're contributing to Alberta and their families. Naomi, um, always a pleasure to chat with you. And I am so uh, happy that this week is turning out to be a great week because uh, I, I, I look forward to people hearing these conversations because you, like I said, you are every, you are the neighbor. You the oil and gas workers are your neighbors. The chemists are your neighbors. They are doing their best and they are living. And uh, we, this province was built on the oil and gas industry and the energy industry, and it will still be there for times to come. Um, I, I thank you for being honest, open, and willing to have this conversation because I think we need to have this conversation and we don't always have to look at the presidents and the CEOs of the companies to tell the story because you just told a story that maybe might not have been told. So thank you. Of course, happy to be on. <laughs>